mm-hmm. available. Mm-hmm. And then uh, because they weren't around for Billy Joel's previous album, 51st Street. Right. And then 53rd Street, of course, was on. Of course. Everyone CD. had that. Of course. It's a lot like uh, Billy Joel's 52nd Street was a lot like the Mario games of right. the Nintendo systems. Right. You know, it comes right with them. Uh, the first record to come out on CD of U2's was War. That's huh. the first one that has that. Is the, the uh, U two has an album called War? Yeah, we talked about it the last episode. Huh? I need to check that out. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Unforgettable Fire for me. This is yep. a a good album. Again, I didn't discover U two until Josh Retreat. But so at this I, point, you're you're a babe in the woods. You're living on top of the roller coaster in Santa Cruz, yep. or in Jason Patrick's butthole, <laughs> right? And. <laughs> I was burrowed up in that butthole. Um, <laughs> you don't know anything about U2 at this point. This record comes out. You you don't know. You, you don't give a shit. Wait, I was 11 years old. Um, in 84. I, in 94. I'm 14, by the way. Okay, oh, so you're at the prime out. age for this, like, Oh, I'm sound. ready for it. But the, the, the thing about this album that's really interesting is they're, it's their first kind of dive into the idea of changing it up with every album changing their sound completely let me read a quote uh from uh bono here okay so they they had just done war they got pretty popular right but not massively they got like fill the greek theater pop yeah exactly uh bono says uh Really? Did he say that? (laughs) He did. He said it. Um, Okay. Bono says... First of all, they say... um, uh, In the 10th issue of U2 Magazine, issued in February 1984... Are you still a subscriber to U2 Magazine, by the way? Uh... There's a U2 magazine? How, how <laughs> I don't know I if it's never st- heard of this. I don't know if it still exists. But he hinted at changes were going to come. Uh, the band had recorded their first three albums with producer Steve Lillywhite, who we mm-hmm. talked about in the last episode. And rather than create the, quote, son of war, they sought experimentation. Both Lillywhite and the band agreed that it was time for a change of producers to not repeat the same formula Okay, Steve Lillywhite yeah, agreed. I'm, sh- I'm yeah. sure he was really psyched about that. <laughs> Super psyched. You guys are about to get huge. Should I have why a job you, or why not have a job? we go our separate ways? <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. Uh, that's Bono just saying, Steve, you're not going to work on this new record. And him just going, Steve and I had a great conversation. He really agreed with me. But again, they brought he he. But he did. He worked on all of their. I like. Didn't he do engineering on all of their albums? I don't know that he worked at all with them on the next ones. I don't think so. I think huh. Daniel Lenoir was the the guy who did uh, well, he, the engineering on because Eno and Daniel Lenoir came into the mix at this point, right? Because Bono's sitting there going, "Okay, who should produce this record?" Because he, I can't find the quote right now, but he says that he knew that the world was ready for another band like The Who. Mm -hmm. And he knew that they could be that if they wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Now, how how weird is that to know that you could be the next The Who if you wanted to be? Like, who doesn't want to be... Well, it's interesting because he's... He's kind of saying, like, we could have been the Who, but we decided to, to be, be the Beatles. Yeah. Or, yeah. like, something, yeah. something that transcends. Better. Yes. Yeah, because the Who is some people's favorite band of all time. Sure. Like, maybe Eddie Vedder's, possibly. Sure. or but, but somehow they're not the Beatles or the Stones. Well, no, they're not. I, 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 I like the Who a lot, but I think that there's a certain ceiling with the Who. Whereas, mm-hmm. you think of the Beatles or... Um, the stones to a lesser degree, the but who? it's kind of like they're this limitless. Were you going to say the Who? <laughs> I did say the Who. <laughs> Do you think the Who are like one of the great bands? I never. You know what their problem is? I think is they they don't have consistent, really consistent records. No albums. You know, no. if they had better, like if they had a Sergeant Pepper, like you know Tommy and and Quadrophenia are, are great. But yeah. um, anyway, I don't know. This, you know, what we're not talking about the Who. But it's interesting because they thought with War we could be, if we keep going down if we this keep path, we putting could out be records the who. like the War, we could be the Who, and right. people are ready for that. But 
they decided, and I think when they say they decided, Bono just decides yeah. things, right? right. It seems that way. I mean, every record I've read about, it's like Bono has an idea, mm-hmm. and then you hear the Edge didn't want to do it, and then had to be convinced. Right. Right. So Bono basically just does whatever he wants. But Bono was like, look, I don't want to put out another war, another record like War, which, as we talked about the last episode, is very immediate, has great songs. I want to do something more experimental and, they said, a little more European. Mm -hmm. So who do they go to? They have, uh, they were looking at the producer, they were looking at Jimmy Iovine. Don't know why they passed up on him because they seem to be buddies now. Uh, they were looking... Uh, well, he produced Rattle and Hum. Did he? Yeah. Oh, boy. Why are they still friends? <laughs> um, they, uh, they considered approaching Connie Plank, whose previous credits included Can and Kraftwerk. That would have been huh. interesting. A little early for that. A little early for Stark that. Of a we'll turn. get to that period pretty soon in pretty the Pretty soon. They also thought about approaching Roxy Music producer Rhett Davies, but instead they uh-huh. go to a former Roxy Music band member, Brian Eno, yeah. uh, who The Edge had a long appreciation of his work, liked his ambient music. Yeah. Meanwhile, I think Bono likes his work with Talking Heads. He had done several Talking Heads. Sounds like they were looking for something lush. Like when you think of, when I think of Roxy music, which I really like, I think mm-hmm. of lushness. I think what they were looking for just not to do rock music yeah. in the way that they did. So Eno takes a meeting with them. All right. I'm. Uh, who knows where this meeting is at? Right. It's not here on Wikipedia. I'll tell you that much. Okay. I would like that kind of information because, quite honestly, this is the comprehensive and encyclopedic compendium of knowledge about you too. And I don't have that information at my you fingertips. Don't, you, you don't have footage of this meeting. I did not. I chased down some sources. No so, one would talk on the record. So Eno and Lanois were not a team at this point. Lanois is his engineer. Eno... So Lanois was his engineer with Roxy Music? I don't well, really no. know. Okay, Eno was a band member of Roxy Music. No, left, yeah. left after two records. Okay. So he was not there for the... He he was the, the guy who basically did sound experiments. Right, he didn't right. play... He doesn't play instruments. So did he work with Lanois like on his solo records? Probably the Talking Heads, maybe, uh-huh. or something. I, I don't have that information either because it's not about U2. I know everything about U2, obviously. <laughs> if, I mean, if you want to talk about Lanois... Wait a second. Are you talking U2 to me? As a matter of fact, I am. Uh, he brought along Lanois saying, this is my engineer. He should do your record. Right. I don't want to do your record. He's not a fan. Okay. He's not a fan of you 2 He listens to them goes, you know what? They're too obvious. I don't yeah. like it. Too on the nose. Too on the nose. Meanwhile, Bono, who we talked about it before. He's a 24-year-old guy. This came out in, in 1985 when he was 25, but he must be 24 when they start recording this. Right. He's a 24-year-old guy. He somehow changes Brian Eno's mind. Well, he's a very persuasive young man. He won't shut the fuck up, is right. I think what you're trying to say. Right. <laughs> and I think it, probably Brian Eno just found it easier to go, okay, Bono, whatever. Yeah. I'll do whatever you want. Uh, they agree to do it. Now, meanwhile, Lanois, what he does in the partnership I'm reading is he does all the recording. Uh Uh-huh. Eno sits around telling them what What? he thinks about it. Right. That's his only job. That's really really his only job is to go, well, you know, uh, I don't like it. Or, yeah, this is better. And uh, Lanois handles all of the technical. Handles everything else. Interesting. And probably says, well, I has as equal a vote of like, well, yeah. I like this, I, I don't yeah. like this. From what I understand, Lanois liked the straight ahead rock music and Brian Eno did not like those songs. So right. Pride in the Name of Love, I think Eno, not a fan. Right. Uh, Lanois, that was his. Well, it's interesting because in their, in their later records, um, especially... I'm thinking of uh, No Line on the Horizon, which is the Eno Lanois collaboration again. Mm-hmm. In the credits, you can see sometimes Eno's not even involved, and it's yeah. just this one's Lanois. And they started kind of parsing out who worked on what, I rather s- than it just being Eno Lanois, which I thought was strange that they would specify who did what. I've heard that about Rick Rubin as well. Or you hear that about like Dr. Dre and some mm-hmm. producers how their their involvement is they'll come by to the sessions, sit right. on a couch for a half hour. Right. Lie down sometimes if that famous Rick Rubin <laughs> and well, listening heard Rick to Jay-Z. Rick Rubin produces from his house via satellite. Mm. I don't know if that's via Skype maybe. Maybe. 
You know, hey, there's all sorts of ways. Let's talk about the modern era for a little Listen, bit. Listen, satellites. It, it's almost as if our lives wouldn't even function without the use of satellite technology. You know, you know what I like about email? Is Tell like me. you type it up on your smartphone, on sure. your iPad, on your computer. Yeah. You send it off to a buddy. Yeah. Almost instantaneously it gets there. Boom, he has it. He has the info that you're trying to put across. Her. Buddy, you got my info. Want to grab lunch? What do you think mm-hmm. about this? Hey, did you see uh, Did you see her? What'd you think? Hey, mm, I liked it a lot. Just this, send this send is the email a, back. That's an example of emails it's, going sorry. back. Yeah, Like you send an email. Did you see the movie Her? What did you think? Meanwhile, the other person gets that email, then writes one back, which is an important part of the email. It's not a one-way street when it comes it's to emails. It's super easy. You just hit reply. Type in your response. Whether you probably be, have to hit the space bar a few times in between words. Yeah, or just once. If it's a two-word email, well, then you just hit it. Oh once. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, you're I just probably going to hit it a few times if, if you're you have, writing a longer. If you email. have two words, you're going to hit the space bar once between those words. Otherwise, you're going to get an unusual-looking uh, email. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Hey, you know what? Hey, I'm not going to say you're right, but you're not wrong. Thank you. All right, here we go. So, you know, I think he's just kind of sitting around doing what he does. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently with Bowie. I think he'd worked with Bowie at this point. On, yeah, he uh, did Berlin with him. <clears throat> or low, yeah, the low uh, heroes uh-huh. and possibly Lodger. I can't remember. Is there not a Bowie album called Berlin? There is not. It's his Berlin period. Oh, uh, okay. So. Where he recorded everything at Hansa. Am I right? Mm, hey, you know what? I'm not going to say you're right, but you're not wrong. Hey. Unless you're wrong. Thanks. <laughs> All right, buddy. Hey, Hit me up with one of those emails we've been talking about, sure. by the way. I would love to get one from you. I've been waiting. Um, so Eno's sitting around. He's he's telling people what he thinks. He's maybe holding up his cards. You've heard about his cards, right? No. He has a stack of cards that I believe he wrote himself. He, he might sell them, by the way, now, um, that has just weird instructions. And he pulls them at random holds it up, and whatever it says, the band then has to do while they're playing. Like what? So there'll be, like, drop it down half a step. Uh-huh. Some some of them are musical uh, instructions, mm-hmm. like all of a sudden go double speed. And then some of them are, like, more, like... Uh, esoteric. Esoteric, put a sense of fun into it. Uh-huh. Or, you know what I mean? And then that's how he experiments with... So you have one with- that says, show me your penis? <laughs> Because I'd like one that says, "Show me those nips." So it sounds like you're you, you're. It sounds like you think that Brian Eno is lazy or something, or do you just think <clears> that think, he's more of a heady guy? Look, I love everything that he's worked on. Me too. I love his solo stuff too. I love his solo stuff too. Like for a guy who does not uh, play instruments, as far as I know, like yeah. he's put out amazing records. I'm just saying, nice work if you can get it. Hey. To stand in a room and just kind of share your thoughts and be probably a dick about it. You got to assume that he's. <laughs> Why would you assume that? Well, just anyone telling you what to do—that's a producer and a director's job. But I mean, you know what I mean? Is yeah. like basically to be like. But it sounds like at this point they wanted someone to come in and just mix up what they're doing. They wanted to, you know what? They wanted to put their influences into a blender. Yep. And just see what came out. Yeah. So. My thing about this album yeah. is that... Let's talk about... Because we have to talk about the un- Unforgettable Fire at yes. some point. <laughs> so this is your... Wh- tell me why you, why it's your favorite. Um, okay. I said that is it, it was... because it was... I'm going to tell you why it is. Okay. Is it because it was just at a... You, you, you truly kind of... It blew your mind at the time and you truly discovered this band? Let me tell you about, about my experiences with this record. Okay. So it, ca- it comes out October 1, 1984. You've said that four times. <laughs> okay. So uh, the first single is Pride in the Name of Love. In yeah. my opinion, it's probably the best and maybe most quintessential U2 song. Okay. I would say it's my favorite U2 song. That version of it? The Any version of it. Okay. I, uh, the, the song, I can hear it a million times. I love it. It somehow is not pl- overplayed like some of their mm-hmm. singles are to me. I can hear it so many times. And if you hear it in concert, it's one of the greatest experiences. For sure. To- I love that song. And yet it was, as much of it, it was a hit, it's it's not a massive hit like With or Without You that yeah. comes on in the elevators and stuff. Like yeah. that. I love that song. Okay, so that's the first 
uh, relation I have to the record is is that comes out uh, the videos out all the time. I talked a little bit on the last episode about how I was uh, introduced to you two in the church. Oh uh, yeah, I remembered watching this Christian uh, station in L.A. on the UHF channel mm-hmm. that had a Friday night videos. Oh yeah, where they would they would do. Uh, um, it was called Friday Night Videos. No, that's a totally different oh. thing. <laughs> it's not a Christian. Oh, that, it was, that was Christian, NBC, the yeah. Christian version of Friday yes. Night Videos. And they would lead with this every week because it was massive and this and U2 is a Christian band supposedly okay we don't you know we don't know if they still are but uh, I think they may be going to hell is all I'm trying to say okay okay <laughs> so in any case you that's, sound so suspicious I, I, I personally I think they've sinned at least once since they started being in the band I don't know did maybe we talk half about, of once did we talk about who the members of the band are for this record Bono okay we got Bono we got uh, on on uh, on the axe, uh, yeah. Otherwise, the, AKA the, the guitar, string. the get fiddle. We got the edge, Dave <laughs> Evans. <laughs> the okay. edge, and then uh, uh, bringing up the rear on uh, the rhythm section there on bass, guitar, and drums. We got Adam Clayton. Uh huh. Uh-huh. And, and then he's his father's son, the drummer. We got good old Drummy. What's his? What's uh, Drummy? Dr- drum. Jerry. Jerry O. Four. O. Four. Jerry O. Four. That. That's. That sounds right to me. That sounds pretty accurate to me. So you got these guys. They're they're doing. <laughs> okay. So you. 